Welcome to the Center for Global Ethnography. My name is Shara Kathiranagama, and I'm one of the co-directors of the center. In this conversation, I'll be talk talking with Professor Dr. Marcia Langton, who is an Associate Provost, the Redmond Barry Distinguished Professor, and the Foundation Chair of Australian Indigenous Studies at the University of Melbourne. Before we proceed, I'd like to respectfully advise Aboriginal peoples and Torres Strait Islanders that this conversation will contain a reference to deceased persons. In this conversation, Professor Langton reflects upon Black Lives Matter protests in Australia, a longer history of Aboriginal struggles, and the, tells us and reflects upon the extreme nature of custodial deaths and incarceration of Aboriginal communities in Australia. She also discusses how this links to a broader vision of Aboriginal sovereignty and visions of justice and the future. Hi, my name is Sharika Thiranagama and I'm speaking to you today from um, the ancestral homeland of the Ramayutush Ohlone people, otherwise known as Menlo Park. And I'm speaking to Professor Marcia Langton, um, welcome, Professor Langton. I just want to advise any viewers um, that I, I want to advise Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people that in this conversation, we will um, have images and references to deceased persons. Thank you, Professor Langton, for being with us. Marcia, can I begin by just asking you to tell us a little bit about the Black Lives Matter protests in Australia and how you see the relationship between these protests now and you know, kind of longer running protests in Australia around Aboriginal and Torres Strait Island communities. And if you think that there are significant differences in this contemporary moment, in these contemporary protests, I don't know, in methods, audiences, protesters, than in previous years. Um, good morning from Naram Sharika. Um, Thank you for having me on your podcast. Um, I'm speaking to you from NARM, otherwise known as Melbourne, um, and this is the country of the Woiwurrung speaking peoples, the Wurundjeri people and the Bunurong people. And I acknowledge the traditional owners and pay my respects to their elders past and present. You've asked a very good question. It's one that's uh, been, many of us here in Naram have been thinking about this year. Um, of course, this year, the Black Lives Matters protests um, in Australia were uh, attended by tens of thousands of people. Um, and there, there have been further Aboriginal deaths in custody in Australia this year. Um, at this stage, um, on the current count conducted uh, by The Guardian, there, are, there have been more than 460 deaths since the Royal Commission into Aboriginal deaths in custody um, that reported to the Australian Parliament in 1991. I suspect there have been many more that have not been counted. Um, I... My guess is that we, uh, are prob we probably have over 800 Aboriginal deaths in custody since nine, 1991 now. So the protests this year, of course, yes, like elsewhere in the world, were inspired by the protests at the death of George Floyd um, in, in America. And... Uh, we were reminded by that, in, that incident, that terrible incident of how brutal the police are towards people uh, who are not white. And uh, we've lived with this problem in Australia since colonisation. So in 1991, uh, when the Royal Commission into Aboriginal Deaths in Custody tabled its report, there was very little interest in the matter. So this year with the protests, very large protests, um, 
And the attention drawn to so many cases of deaths in custody, unnecessary deaths in custody, um, we do feel, I think, that we have a better chance of getting some of the reforms that are required. Uh, when I first became familiar with this issue in the 1980s when I was living in Alice Springs, I met a woman who uh, had come from the Kimberley uh, remote area of Australia by bus and she told me that she was travelling around the country to talk to people and, and to find out why the deaths in custody were happening and if other people would help her to do something about these deaths in custody. The first death in custody that drew our attention to this problem was the de death of a, a young man in Western Australia, John Pat. There had been hundreds, possibly thousands before that, but his case attracted our attention because it was so brutal and, and so unnecessary and he was so young. And uh, it was actually the mothers of the young men who were dying in custody who organised the first protests in the 1980s. And uh, they set up a, uh, a campaign. Um, and many years later, that campaign is now, now consists of tens of thousands of people because the deaths in custody don't stop. I think this year alone in Australia, there have been five that I know of. There might be more that have not been reported. Uh, so yes, uh, there has been a great change uh, since the 1980s when this issue first became apparent to us. Uh, from a small group of mothers to tens of thousands of people on the streets. And indeed, it's a global movement now. And attention has been drawn particularly to uh, the issue of police accountability. So deaths in custody occur in uh, police custody, but also in prisons, um, whether a prisoner is in remand or uh, in detention uh, after sentencing, uh, we find that uh, deaths in custody occur in all of those circumstances. But it's the police custody that is the most dangerous and the most risky for Aboriginal detainees. And so the issue of police accountability has become a very important issue. The police have not responded with reforms uh, they say that they have, but there is no evident reform. There have been coronial inquiries investigating deaths in custody. The coronial inquiries have made recommendations to the police and still there is no evidence that the police are implementing the over 300 recommendations of the Royal Commission into Aboriginal deaths in custody, nor are they implementing the recommendations of many coronial inquiries. Marcia, you've also highlighted, with, because you've been, as you say, you've been working on this for a very long time, you've also highlighted the predicament of um, Indigenous women and girls also, and the incarceration of children and the criminal age of responsibility in Australia too, as it has emerged in these incarceration rates. And I wonder if you could tell us a little bit about that too. Another matter that's come to our attention in Australia is the rapidly rising rate of uh, imprisonment of Aboriginal women. Um, and also the juvenile detention rates are just extraordinary. Uh, for instance, in the Northern Territory, every child in juvenile detention is Aboriginal, 100% of the detainees in the juvenile detention system in the Northern Territory are Aboriginal. In Western Australia last year, Aboriginal women were being detained by police for simply calling the police for assistance in domestic violence matters. So the police were arresting victims of domestic violence on the grounds that they had not paid a fine 
One woman was arrested for not paying a fine for having a barking dog and her fine ended up being over $3,000. And a wonderful lawyer right, started a campaign uh, to free the women from prison in Western Australia and she raised money to pay their fines. And thousands of people donated to get women out of prison. And it wasn't until uh, just recently that the Western Australian government changed its law to stop the incarceration of people for non-payment of fines. However, the police made it very clear that they would continue to arrest people for non-payment of fines and that uh, they would retrospectively apply the old law to all cases. So the police are, are determined to persist with what criminologists call their carceral logic. Um, just during the COVID-19 pandemic and the very severe restrictions imposed by Australian states and territories, um, police have been uh, fining um, those who they perceive to be breaching restrictions um, laws and the burden of the fines has fallen mostly on Aboriginal people and African Australians. The highest rate of fines are on the poorest of the poor and of course black people. So uh, again, even during the pandemic, the police will not stop harassing Aboriginal people and African Australians. And, you know, I know that Aboriginal communities have been struggling against this since colonization. So, you know, many of this is known, but how do you think, how much of this is being brought into the consciousness of white people, for example, in Australia now? Or is it something that was always known and always ignored by um, non-black people? in Australia or is it something that you think is coming to some sort of consciousness as issues to be discussed now? Because I, I, mean, I, I wish I could say that uh, the attitude of non-Indigenous Australians had changed. This year, the Change the Record campaign um, managed to run such a successful campaign that one of the demands uh, were, was, came before the Council of Australian Governments, and that is that the age of criminal responsibility should be raised from 10 to 14 in line with human rights standards. The Council of Australian Governments refused to do so, and the age of criminal responsibility in Australia remains at 10 years of age in breach of human rights standards. And the excuse used by the Council of Australian Governments was that the Western Australian Government was not prepared to expose the community to the criminality that would be involved in raising the age from 10 to 14. Um, it, it beggars belief that a government could say that to the Australian people. And yet, I think that does in fact represent the attitudes of Australians non-Indigenous Australians, uh, or the majority of them. Of course, many thousands of non-Indigenous Australians joined us in the protests. But I think we're in, still in the minority in, in demanding um, changes, such as uh, raising the age of criminal responsibility. And I'm glad that you brought that up because I think actually a lot of people outside of Australia don't know about this particular issue that, as you say, disproportionately affects um, Aboriginal communities too. And where do you think now then you, you want, I mean, these are things that you've been talking about for a long time and you've been involved also in commenting on and asking for the implementation of the Royal Commission long before this moment. Where do you see your work and your energies going from now on? I mean, where, where do you want things to go? Well, I do believe that uh, discussions like this uh, 
that will have an audience are tremendously important in bringing awareness um, to people about this situation. I think many Australians are simply not aware of how the police behave and how the correctional services system um, is responsible for people not coming out of detention alive. There's a very simple principle, and that is that if you are arrested and detained, you have the expectation that you will live through the experience. Your family and friends should be able to expect that you will come out of that experience alive. Being arrested, being imprisoned should not be a death sentence. But I think most Aboriginal people in Australia have the very valid fear that the arrest of an Aboriginal person may in all likelihood lead to that person's death. And so you can see what the problem is there. And that is that it is impossible to have confidence in the rule of law when the arrest, when one's arrest might mean, is likely to mean a death sentence. How is it then possible, for instance, for victims of domestic violence to feel safe in calling the police for assistance? And this is a very serious problem in Australia. Most Aboriginal women will not call the police in cases of domestic violence. And so the domestic violence rates are growing every year. They're extreme and domestic violence causes enormous harm, not just to individuals, but to families and communities as well, and especially to children. And so basically we have now, I think, a very um, serious problem that the rule of law in Australia only applies uh, in principle to white people. People of colour cannot have confidence in Australia's legal system, cannot have confidence in its criminal justice system because there are far too many breaches, not just of uh, human rights, but also of the very laws themselves. Um, and that lack of confidence in our legal system uh, undermines any efforts to reduce incarceration rates. In some parts of Australia, our incarceration rates are the highest in the world recorded. Uh, and that was also the case when I was working for the Royal Commission into Aboriginal Deaths in Custody, and that has not changed in 30 years. So uh, it beggars belief that Australian governments cannot pay attention to this problem in a responsible way. There are a number of other issues that need urgent attention. One is a custody notification scheme that is national and universal. Now, when a prisoner is a, uh, taken into the cells, the police should immediately call the Aboriginal Legal Service or a designated Aboriginal organisation or person so that the prisoner is able to speak to somebody and, uh, and have uh, their detention monitored by a responsible person. Now, the custody notification scheme was implemented for a brief period of time following the Royal Commission into Aboriginal Deaths in Custody, but then the state and territory governments dispensed with it for no apparent reason, and then there were many more deaths in custody. Now, there was a campaign to have it reinstated, but it's been reinstated only in one jurisdiction. That must be universal. It must apply in every jurisdiction. And it is a one uh, important measure that will prevent deaths in custody. 
and another, uh, and this has never been implemented, a recommendation of the Royal Commission into Deaths in Custody, that there be medical personnel, a doctor or a nurse, um, to make an assessment of each prisoner to ensure that people do not die in custody from pre-existing conditions. And um, unfortunately, many of the deaths have been unnecessary and have resulted from the police failing to obtain medical assistance for people who are clearly in, at severe risk um, because of a health condition, because of injuries. Um, in one case, in the case of Ms. Du in the Pilbara, she died an agonising death over many days because neither the police nor the hospital would treat her for broken ribs that resulted in septicemia. You know, these conversations and, you know, these absolutely brutal stories are telling that, you know, show both systemic failure, but it's clear, link it so clearly to colonization and racism. Here in the US, there's been a lot of discussions of reform, abolition, reform, teleabolition. I mean, there's a there's a lot of discussions of where people, what what are the different kind of visions of um, um, the police that they should be defunded and so on. And I wondered, are there conversations also in Australia which are running on those themes, or what what are the visions that people have? more broadly for what they want this, what they want to do with the police that is so clearly formed around racism and colonization. Yes, well, there are two important issues. One is police accountability. So in Australia, the police investigate the police. There is no independent uh, system of inquiry um, to assess police behavior and to report to the public. Indeed, uh, because of the police investigate the police, um, the public almost, you know, most often do not find out what has happened. There might be a small newspaper report saying that a police officer has been suspended or that, or what is more likely is that no action has been taken and the police were found to have acted uh, in accordance with police guidelines. There is a campaign for police accountability in Australia and so far no uh, independent uh, system of inquiry for police um, malpractice, um, failures in their, in their, in their duties ha uh, has been implemented. The other matter is uh, what we call um, justice reinvestment programs. So I think justice reinvestment pro programs um, would fall under what in America is called defund the police. Um, so in Australia, there are some very successful justice reinvestment programs, in, and in particular one in Burke in northwest New South Wales, where the community wanted to stop their young people from ending up in the criminal justice system. You see, the problem for so many Aboriginal families and communities is that people know that it, the most likely um, career for their children is in the criminal justice system. People cannot look forward to their children graduating from high school and pursuing a career because they, their education pathways and their aspirations will be cut short by the endless harassment of police, rounding up people and especially young people in communities because that's all the police have to do. Our communities are over-policed. And so the community in Burke established the Burke uh, Justice Reinvestment Project to identify children who were at risk of being um, caught up in the criminal justice system and develop programs to uh, 
well, basically to teach them how to stay out of the criminal justice system, but also to improve their lives, their sense of self-esteem. In, in, especially in small towns, Aboriginal children grow up thinking that life is, you know, a, a matter of being on the run for, from the police. So police target children and uh, they target Aboriginal children, but not just Aboriginal children. I, I think uh, eventually Australians will wake up to the fact that they too are in danger from the police. There was a case in here in Victoria where an off-duty policewoman, non-Indigenous, a white woman, was arrested by the police and the CCTV from the cells showed them stomping on her with their boots and, uh, you know, basically they, they refused to believe that she was a police officer and they, they brutalised her in the cells. She took them to court. I don't think she got much justice because this is, you know, there is no police accountability. Um, that's a very serious problem. But governments are also reticent to fund justice reinvestment projects um, also. And I think we need a, a radical culture change uh, to stop the... Uh, the police from criminalising more and more people uh, simply because the police are racist, um, because they get brownie points for rounding people up. Um, you know, the police systems need to change. Uh, I do believe that we need another Royal Commission. We need a Royal Commission into the police forces in Australia. Um, absolutely the worst uh, in Western Australia, uh, Queensland and the Northern Territory, although New South Wales and Victoria are fast catching up to, uh, to those states. Uh, there have been deaths in custody in Victoria and New South Wales this year. Again, unne unnecessary deaths. At the moment in, in the Northern Territory, a police officer is on trial for shooting a young man at Yundamu, um, and we are waiting for the findings of, of that court. Um, he shot the young man in the back, I believe, several times. Um, so we shall see um, soon if there is justice in the Walker case at Yundamu. Well, we can, we can only hope. I mean, and just I'm I'm so interested to hear about the justice reinvestment schemes because sometimes I think I've heard here also people talking about the need for more social workers and so on. But in Australia, it's also the social work system has also been tied up surely with the oppression of Aboriginal communities. So there is the police, but isn't there a larger also carceral logic? I mean, so where do people is is there any part of the of that kind of state welfare and caste system that people think could be reformed, or is it all is it all pervaded with this kind of logic? Um, you've hit the nail on the head, Sharika. It's all pervasive. One of our state premiers who understood this problem, the late Joan Kerner, a wonderful woman, she was premier of Victoria in the nineteen eighties told a joke at a social work conference um, which outraged white Australians, but uh, I remember it to this day. She told the social work conference this joke, what is the difference between a social worker and a rotwheeler? Well, you'll, you have more, you'll have more luck getting your kid back off the rotwheeler than off the social worker. Um, so she was forced to apologise because of the, the outrage, but uh, the joke is one of those, you know, sadly true uh, black humour jokes. And today the problem is, again, say, for instance, with uh, violence against women and children, if a woman calls the police, 
to ask for assistance, the police automatically contact various agencies, including the child protection workers and social workers, and they pretty much automatically remove the children from the family. And that's another reason why Aboriginal women will not call the police for assistance in matters of violence because they are afraid that their children will be removed. And of course, what happens is that extremely violent men weaponize the, the legal system against women and they force a situation where the children are removed in order to punish the woman even more. So the social workers themselves are caught up in this system of violence. And now uh, we have rates of removal of Aboriginal children from their families as a result of this that are sky high. Uh, there are presently about roughly 20,000 Aboriginal children in out of home care across Australia. Um, and, you know, families have been broken apart by social workers who are by and large white and racist. And they think the best outcome for an Aboriginal child is to be removed from his or her family. And so the historical removal of Aboriginal children that was examined by a Human Rights Commission inquiry, the Bring Them Home inquiry into the forced removal of Aboriginal children, which uncovered the removal of thousands of Aboriginal children um, in order to assimilate them into white society. Those practices uncovered by that human rights inquiry continue under the guise of social work. And I guess that's what gives just this reinvestment scheme such a poignant edge, right? Because they're about reinvesting in the community and the family too. Yes, exactly. The ability of Aboriginal families to stay together, to not be torn apart by the authorities, who are, after all, just, you know, normal white Australians who are racist and don't like Aborigines living in their town. Of course, the police and the social work workers are going to cause harm to Aboriginal people. This is why the system has to change. And it's why Aboriginal organisations are so tremendously important. The Aboriginal community controlled organisations that provide services uh, are required and are necessary to maintain um, Aboriginal families and to prevent the destruction of Aboriginal families by, by, by the authorities. Uh, the trauma of the stolen generations, the historical stolen generations, is exacerbated by the ongoing um, harassment of Aboriginal families by social workers and the trauma is intensified. We now have severe cases of intergenerational trauma that of course result in, in, in uh, people breaking the law and ending up in the system. So the justice reinvestment programs are well designed to prevent uh, increasing incarceration unnecessary deaths in custody, removal of children from families and strengthening family life and raising the self-esteem of people and giving them the tools to deal with the authorities in their towns and communities to stop this abuse of Aboriginal people by the carceral logic of the Australian state, which is uh, basically post-colonial uh, and yet so very colonial in all of its ways. And actually, if I can, that sort of leads me to ask you about how connected this is to the kind of broad other corpus of your work, which is not separate from, but on sovereignty, 
and questions of aboriginal sovereignty well not questions of the struggle for sovereignty let's say and you know and i wanted maybe whether you could talk about that too well my my attitude to aboriginal sovereignty is that the best way that aboriginal people uh, have explained what that means is when they talk about their spiritual connection to the land and it is that spiritual connection to places that is at the core of what is meant by Aboriginal sovereignty. And recently the High Court of Australia found that the spiritual connection of an Aboriginal person uh, to the place that they are affiliated with uh, is a matter rec now recognised in Australian law. So I was very pleased to see that. Um, what uh, is important to understand is that the Australian Constitution is a racist constitution. Um, now, it has been amended. It was amended in 1967 following a referendum. It, Australians were asked to vote following a very long campaign by Aboriginal leaders and their allies to remove two sections of the Constitution that were racist. Um, and the most important one was uh, the powers of the parliament to make laws. Prior to 67, the Parliament of Australia could make laws for the people of Australia except Aborigines. So the parliament could not make laws for Aborigines prior to 67. And the second one was that the census uh, in our constitution prior to 67 could not include Aborigines. So Aborigines were not included in the census at all. And uh, that also changed, but the, co the constitution remains racist. Um, and section 25 is one of the hangovers from the 1901 constitution written entirely by white male colonists uh, and with a very explicit intention of excluding Aboriginal people from the nation. So there is a movement now for the recognition of Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people in the constitution. There's been a very long debate about this issue. And there, in 2017 at Uluru, in Central Australia, 250 delegates, uh, Aboriginal and Islander delegates met at the National Indigenous Constitutional Convention and unanimously agreed on the Uluru Statement from the Heart, which calls for a voice to parliament, uh, truth telling and makarata and makarata refers to a treaty making process. Um, I'm involved in a process with government at the moment to establish a voice to parliament and government will we'll make recommendations to the Minister for Indigenous Australians in October. Um, but there, there is, I think, a much longer time to wait for the Australian government to agree to a referendum uh, to enable Australians to vote for the constitutional recognition of an Indigenous voice in the parliament. Uh, the Australian government seems to think that recognising the right of Aboriginal people to speak to parliament through some mechanism um, is unparliamentary. Uh, at least three cabinet ministers have claimed that we're de demanding a third chamber of parliament, the destruction of parliamentary sovereignty and so on. I mean, the sky always is about to fall in whenever Aboriginal people demand a, a simple and reasonable right. Uh, so there's a long way to go with that matter. But the problem, of course, at the heart of all of this is that historically in Australia and in our constitution and in our laws, Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people have been defined as uh, 
as a racial group. Now, that's because in the 19th century, um, white people were obsessed with notions of race and the idea that they, they were at the peak of human evolution and uh, that all other races were inferior. And so uh, these racial definitions and racial laws are uh, hangovers from co colonisation and the imperial endeavour, endeavours of, of the European colonisers. Uh, but they remain very powerful in our constitution and our laws. The problem is that, uh, you know, the facts don't fit this, these mad race theories anymore. You know, the human genome's been mapped. Um, there's very little difference between human beings on supposed racial grounds uh, and, and modern medicine is not cognizant of race. It's just, you know, it's not a, a useful category in any scientific or social way anymore. And yet it remains so powerful in our laws and our constitution. Rather, we need to think of indigenous people here in Australia as peoples. So our ancestors are known to have been living here 65,000 years ago. So Aboriginal cultures are the longest continuous human cultures on earth. So we are peoples. We had societies for many thousands of generations before the white people came. They came and they classified us as an inferior race. That's wrong. We are peoples and we should be recognised as peoples. And you've advocated explicitly using peoplehood or first people, right, as a kind of, as the most appropriate. I do, yes. And I've written about that. Quite a bit. And I wanted to ask you, so, I mean, this is the kind of histories that, you know, these are the histories and struggles that maybe we should know, which is more than just this moment about what's happening. I mean, these you've just kind of unrolled so many of the history, struggles, context, um, you know, kind of visions that we have to understand about this moment. Is there any others you think for those of us who are looking in at what's going on in Australia that we should really also connect to this? Um, to Black Lives Matter, I mean, I guess one question is also about, I mean, you've also worked with asylum seekers, I know, in some of your, I mean, there are all these other struggles at the moment also in Australia around treatment of asylum seekers, treatment of Black migrants to Australia. And do you see any intersections between uh, Aboriginal struggles and those, or um, do they draw inspiration from Aboriginal struggles in Australia? Um. I, I do uh, support the uh, Asylum Seekers Resource Centre in Melbourne whenever I can, um, and I I do um, I recently spoke at a at a function here in Melbourne organised by uh, the member for my electorate Peter Khalil um, with people from. Um, our African communities here in Melbourne. The, uh, the Australian government has breached human rights laws for more than a decade now in incarcerating asylum seekers in terrible, brutal conditions on islands off Australia. Um, and uh, you would have seen the, uh, you would have followed the story of Arush Bashani, who finally escaped from Manus and went to New Zealand, where he's been accepted as a citizen, and his wonderful novel, novel, um, uh, which you know won won awards. Uh, he, he wrote that novel um, from detention on Manus Island. So it breaks my heart that people are escaping um, 
repressive regimes come to Australia seeking um, freedom from repression and run smack bang into one of the most repressive governments on earth and live through hell on Nauru and Manus Island and now Christmas Island where detainees, even children, are being sent. So, yes, the world should be aware of what Australia does to asylum seekers. It's very cruel. So if, if I can ask you, what kind of works have you drawn inspiration from academic or activist, and what do you think um, still needs to be done? What, what kind of, let's say, empirical work, I'm asking because I'm an anthropologist, so I think of that, it could be other as well. Um, do you think that needs to be done alongside these protests, alongside community advocacy? Um. Well, just lately, I've been wondering how to include in university courses more uh, understanding of the problem of the racialization of people by colonisers. There's a very good um, project on the American Anthropological Association website called Race which explains the history of race. Uh, and I think all of the projects, uh, and especially one that I, I think is published in the New York Times, an interactive map of uh, slavery, the history of slavery. The 1619 Project. The 1619 Project. Um, these, this application of our scholarship to these problems and uh, using digital technology and the web to make it available to millions of people is I think the, the, the best breakthrough in you know campaign tactics that I've seen in years. We have one in Australia, um, the um, Frontier Massacres Project. Um, it's, I'll, I'll, um, the documentation of, of frontier massacres on a map by a group of scholars is being mapped um, and documented, and I'll just screen share it with you. So this is the map of the massacres, um, historical massacres that fall within a particular time frame and, an, and, and examined by historians using a very strict historical methodology. Um, and this is from the University of Newcastle, uh, colonial massacres. But some of them, of course, actually go right through into the 20th century. And so they haven't completed it yet, but you can see that they've found uh, hundreds of massacre sites. So the time frame is 1788 to 1930. And uh, it's called the Colonial Frontier Massacres in Australia, 1788 to 1930 project. We'll make sure that we link to, to that as well. So you see those kind of edu sort of multimedia educational website that synthesize, I guess, things that people like you have been talking about for a very long time. None of this is new to, to activists or academics like yourself, but putting it all in a way that makes it accessible. Yes, that's right. And making it accessible to the world. You know, people have often said to us, I didn't know. You know, they said this after the liberation of the Jews in Germany at the end of World War II as well. It is no longer possible to say that you don't know. Yeah. And I, I mean, I think we, we talk about that here in the US too, because it is known and yet for some people it is still unknown. And that in itself is bemusing too, right? Sure. Um, confected ignorance 
racists who deny that they are racists to preserve their system of privilege. Uh, colonial innocence, I guess you might. Yes. There and, are many you know, ways of describing that condition. And can I ask you then, because, you know, you and I are both anthropologists, you're an archaeologist as well, and, you know, obviously our discipline, my discipline has been involved in so much violence and um, in relation to Aboriginal communities too. But do you see like um, a way that in fact, ethnography or archeology span or anthropology can actually do new kinds of work? It, it can never lose its colonial heritage. Of course, that's I, how, how could it, it has to own responsibility, but do you see yourself that there are places where people could go or where you imagine new work could emerge? Well, I'm, I've been involved at the University of Melbourne in efforts to establish our new Indigenous Knowledge Institute. So Indigenous knowledge systems are in grave danger. Um, in Australia, uh, at colonisation, we had at least 250 languages, 600 to 800 language varieties, and uh, Australia has the highest language uh, extinction rate on the planet, and now only 13 of our languages are taught to children in the customary way. So our languages are in grave danger, but so too the Indigenous knowledge systems uh, that we inherited from, the, from deep, our deep past. And many Indigenous people want their languages and their knowledge systems documented and preserved for future generations. And this is tremendously important to them for, uh, say, for instance, land management purposes. Um, as well as all the social reasons, our kinship systems, our traditions, our cultures. But, you know, as the world faces more and more impacts of climate change um, and the severity of the impacts is changing the weather uh, and, and our, our environment so radically and so quickly, people need to use traditional methods to preserve their environment. So many uh, people in Australia, Aboriginal people in Australia, are now reinstating ancient fire management systems using fire to fight fire. And so a movement here in the in the south of Australia is um, being um, implemented by young men, rangers and women who, who are learning from the old people about how to use fire to control our, our bushfires, and they call it cultural burning. Of course, you know, it never stopped in many parts of northern Australia where colonisation was less severe. Um, but uh, a royal commission into the bushfires in Australia recently recommended uh, that scientists investigate traditional Aboriginal fire management methods and, and find ways to implement them to prevent the severity of the bushfires. So I, I, I think, uh, you know, our resilience and our knowledge systems, this is what's important and, and this is, you know, where I hope to do more work. Thank you so much, Marcia, for giving us your time and for sharing your brilliance with us. Um, we greatly appreciate it. And I wish you joy in your day ahead. Thank you. Thank you so much, Sharika. I would really um, appreciate you taking the time to speak to me and, and to hear me out. Uh, and you have a great day too.